Gold has always been a status symbol ever since the ancient Egyptians and maybe even before that. When gold is melted, it can be formed into jewelry such as bracelets, earrings, and necklaces. When gold is reflected in the sun and has a very nice reflection to it, this is most likely what makes gold have such a nice appeal. The California Gold Rush was the real first hunt for gold. It attracted people from all over the world. The rush brought in a huge amount of gold for people and their families. The rush finally ended in 1855. It ended because there was more people than there was gold. This led to fighting between miners and also murders over mining areas. Another reason the rush ended was that people had to dig more for gold instead of panning it just in the river. Many people started to feel that for the work they were putting in, they just weren't getting a good enough amount out. People started getting other jobs because of the lack of gold. People also invested in searching for other areas of mining for gold. The first settlers came to Australia in the 1700s. Before the 1850s, the population of Australia was very small, a mere 4,000 people. Back then, the economy was based off livestock and agriculture. The land was majority farmland before Australia started to develop cities and small communities. The first settlers were mostly white Catholics from different parts of Europe. Because of this, the main religion in Australia became Catholic, and Australian society revolved around that. However, once gold was discovered, it changed Australia and the Australian government forever. <laughs> Australia, rumors of gold jewelry worn by Aborigines started to become very popular throughout Australia. Somehow word reached America that gold was found in Australia. A man by the name of Edward Hammond was a gold miner in California. He was one of the many people that caught wind of the gold in Australia. He decided he would go to Australia because the rush was ending in California. He left his family behind in California and traveled to Australia with two friends. He arrived in 1852 in Victoria. He started digging almost immediately after he arrived. As he was digging, he discovered two ounces and two hours of work. He decided to continue digging in Australia and have his family come too. He sent one of his friends back to California to bring his and their families to Australia to start their new lives. As he was waiting for his wife to arrive, he continued to dig with the knowledge of the locals. He was able to collect 50 ounces before his wife arrived. When she arrived, it wasn't just her. She had apparently told the entire community that she was moving to Australia because of the gold her husband found. After about a year, a thousand people had traveled to Australia. Then in 1855, the Kerr Nugget was discovered. It weighed between 2,380 and 2,284 ounces. It was the largest size nugget found during the rush and is still the largest in the world. The Kerr Nugget was worth $47,600 back then. Today, it is on display at a museum in Australia. If it were sold, it would be worth $3,992,045.40 in today's market. Another large nugget during the rush was the Byers and Holterman specimen. It is the largest in mass nugget ever found. It weighed 3,000 ounces and was worth $56,790 back then. If this nugget were sold today, it would be worth $5,033,010 in today's market. After these large nuggets were found, the news spread to Europe and China about the large nuggets and the large amount of gold being pulled out of the ground. By 1860, the number of people tripled since the start of the rush. Eight years later, in 1868, 3,000 more people had arrived. Two years later, 2,000 more people were living in Australia, which brought the total population to 16,500 people living in Australia. 
This giant raise in population was caused by the lower mining license and raised gold prices during the Eureka Revolt towards the end of the rush. By 1854, 6,000 miners lived in Australia seeking golden fortune. All miners were required by their government to get a mining license whether they were panning in creeks or having multi-thousand dollar gold shares. In 1854 and before, the government in Australia did not have a federal government but had six governments acting as different countries. When more and more miners came to Australia, the government saw an opportunity to have a better economy than the other districts of Australia. The best way governments thought they would do this was increase the price of mining license minimally, but then increase the amount of gold each miner had to pay to the government every month. To ensure that no one would be mining without paying, the government had majority of rivers patrolled by authorities to count miners' gold to make sure they paid the right amount at the end of the month. After a year of this new system, miners and their families became very annoyed with their governments. Many miners started looking for other jobs in addition to mining because the amount of gold they were able to keep was not turning in a livable profit. Other miners decided to start mining unions to change restrictions on mining which would give miners a better income and life. All six governments barely acknowledged the miners' complaints because the miners weren't considered government workers. They were people who gave extra taxes. Realizing this, the miners started going on strike and stopped mining to try and get a better deal with the government. The governments felt an immediate impact on their economies. Government spending became very low due to the lack of intake of gold. The governments realized they had to do something to get the miners back to mining so the governments wouldn't completely disintegrate. The miners knew the governments had to act so mining unions from all six districts of Australia met in Victoria in July of 1854 to discuss a deal to send into the governments so both sides could get what they wanted. They did not wait for the government to act because they knew the government was more worried about a better economy and better government than the other governments. Knowing this, the unions knew they could try and get a deal better for them because of their control over the economy. <laughs> draft of the deal was sent to all six governments in August of 1854. The miners decided to make the deal as fair as possible so the government would sign. In favor of the government, they could keep licenses at the same price and also could continue in collecting gold from the miners. In favor of the miners, the amount of gold the miners had to pay would be decreased. The governments voted on the deal and two of the six districts accepted the votes. This outraged the miners who lived in areas the deal didn't pass. It also confused them because they thought they would accept to help the economy because it would bring in some gold for the government. It also started forcing the miners to go back to mining, otherwise they would have to live in poverty. However, most miners didn't want to give gold to a government that would not allow them to provide for their family. So most miners decided to move to the two districts that did approve the deal. And this outraged the governments. However, the government had forgot about a clause that was on the license. The license said that the miners couldn't sell gold in any of the other districts. This allowed for the government to relax some because they thought the miners would move back to their original homes. When gold buyers denied miners to sell gold, many miners went into poverty instead of moving back because they had spent all their money on moving to a new district. The governments who did not approve the deal now realized that they were in a tight pickle because they had no large supply of income. Because of the sudden increase of poverty, all governments started to struggle. The mining unions met again to make up an additional deal that would benefit both sides again. The final draft of the second deal was sent out in October of 1854. The new parts of this deal only benefited the government, but said that all governments had to accept the previous deal. It said that governments had to allow miners to mine in all of Australia by creating one government with a shared economy. This would allow miners with licenses from one district to mine in other districts. 
which would get rid of the poverty issue and raise the economy.